Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the web native file system, uh, or sometimes we like to say it's sort of like a UNIXFS++ or beyond UNIXFS, which means that this talk is going to be a little bit different from the last couple, um, which were more about full nodes or how to get things uh, moved around, and this is more about specifically the file portion. Uh, I'm Brooklyn Zalka. I'm the CTO at Fission. Yeah, and hi, I'm Philip. Uh, I'm protocol engineer at Fission, and my handler is Matthew Uh And we only have 15 minutes, so we won't be able to talk about everything in depth. Um, but please do come to talk to us after. Um, we've learned a lot along the way building this. Um, and uh, even if you don't end up using all of uh, Web Native, feel free to steal as many of these ideas as you like. So why build something on top of UNIXFS or, or sort of almost like a, a fork of the basic idea? And that is we want to build Web3 apps, local-first apps, um, which requires a few things like portable data, portable runtime. And to do this practically, we have to have at least feature parity with Web2, right? Ideally, do a bunch more things in addition. So that requires all the stuff below that, like access control and being extensible and collaborative and work in hostile places like browsers, right? All of this stuff. Um, and ideally, we also want users to control their own data and be able to use data across applications if they want to. So uh, yeah, you can pull up a file explorer, but you should also be able to take, you know, if you're building an application, um, and have written a JSON file, you should be able to also explore that inside of a file explorer separately. So essentially, just like how you'd expect it to work on Windows or Mac OS, we should get the same experience in the browser or really anywhere this, uh, this runs. Today, we have imp implementation for the browser. Um, we are uh, rewriting it in Rust uh, and WebAssembly so that it'll run uh, absolutely everywhere. So at a very high level, uh, at the top, of course, you have uh, some sort of mutable pointer, uh, IPNS or DNS link. And nested under that, uh, public files, secret files. And we won't talk about these because of time, but uh, a sharing inbox and a sharing outbox. The public file system uh, encapsulates the, the basic data model uh, that this, this works with. So yep, we have regular uh, IPLD nodes. Um, but also extended file nodes that have raw data and then a uh, metadata um, that's fully extensible. You can write arbitrary data into that, just like you can on any modern file system. Um, and this is broken into two components. There's the user space and uh, kernel. So it's essentially what the system manages for you versus what users can actually write into. And that's arbitrary tags, MIME types, sources, commit messages, kind of whatever you'd like. Uh, and then, of course, directories, which can nest um, more data on top of that. Um, hard and soft links. Obviously, content addresses get us uh, this new kind of link that we haven't seen before on the web, right? You can think of this as a hard link from uh, traditional file systems, right, where it says it's exactly this file. And if you have the same file multiple times, you get deduplication, all the stuff that we love from uh, IPFS. But uh, we found we also needed support for soft links or symlinks. Um, and this really uh, behaves like a URL. So if you have a pointer to something, maybe it's in somebody else's data structure on somebody else's uh, file system, uh, or you wanted to track the latest version of something, um, then you give it a URL, and uh, you get all of the, the same trade-offs that URLs have, right? You might uh, break that link potentially. Right? But you're always tracking this, this latest version. Uh, we also found, for, for a bunch of reasons, uh, including um, CRDTs, which I'll get to in a, in a later slide, um, that we wanted uh, versioning. So by default, nothing gets deleted. Um, you only overwrite files, and previous versions stick around. So you can think of this really like Git. So over time, here's one file uh, one layout of one directory, and then we're going to uh, add a file, this headshot, and all that we do is add a new version of this photos directory, uh, a new versions of this avatars um, directory, and then point at the old caricature and this new headshot. We also, uh, this part's not implemented yet, but uh, in the roadmap, uh, including all of the events 
um, involved in that as well, so that if you need to expose to a user, hey, here's the changes from last time, um, that's all tracked automatically uh, as well. Now, this layout, where it looks you know, over time, um, ends up looking like a stream, but really underneath, um, it's still just a DAG that's rooted with a single root, right? Um, it's just harder to think about it in this layout than the other layout. Now, I mentioned before uh, CRDTs, um, having the ability to have multiple writers concurrently at the same time is really, really difficult without building a bunch of stuff on top of uh, IPLD, right? So if somebody is writing, you know, uh, A and then B, and somebody else comes along and writes C, and then a bunch of changes underneath that um, concurrently, we need some way to reconcile these automatically. And so we've made this work automatically for file or directory level changes. If somebody wants to uh, have inside of a file, well, we, we don't know what's inside, right? So it needs um, a plug um, from, the, uh, from the developer to say, oh, this is a, whatever, a Photoshop document, and this is how you'll do that reconciliation. Um, because nothing ever gets deleted, we keep all of this history, and if the automatic reconciliation mechanism failed for some reason, um, or picked the wrong version, uh, you can always go back and say, well, actually, I wanted this other one. So again, a lot like Git, but without having to ever do manual, um, manual merges. Just happens all automatically. And uh, the big, big reason why uh, we started doing this work was because of secret files. So uh, having encryption out of the box uh, is by far the, like, the number one reason why um, people start looking for tools like this. Uh, it works um, fairly simply. We use uh, AES keys to encrypt data, and that is every file and every directory. Uh, each of those gets their own key. This is uh, based on an idea called a crypt tree, which you'll hear about from, from a few of the presentations this afternoon. Um, and what it does is every file is encrypted with its own key, and then the directory that sits inside of has both a pointer down into that file as well as the key to decrypt it. And then that directory has its own key, and the directory that points into that also has the key to decrypt that one. So um, if you can uh, decrypt the root of the, um, the file system, you can decrypt everything or just subdirectories uh, and so on. And you get this nice then isomorphism where uh, if you have a, some unencrypted data, you can encrypt it and vice versa. Right, and so what Brooke just talked about um, enables us to do a bunch of cool use cases. For example, let's say you're using an application, you may not 100% trust it with all of your private files. So what you want to do is you want to share only a specific section of a private file system. Um, we can do this uh, with these script trees uh, by just sharing the key for a certain directory, let's say. Uh, and as you can see here, if you have this key, you can read all of the stuff below because you can just uh, unlock this node, uh, see the next uh, key, and go and forth uh, from there. But if you share, let's say, a key to just a single file uh, very deep in your directory, um, then there's no way for someone having that key to read the rest of the file system. So we do this kind of thing also in the time dimension, not only in the... Uh, in the hierarchy. So essentially what we're, what we're doing is we have a deterministic way of deriving new keys uh, across time for every file and directory. And so every time you write a new version to a directory, a uh, new version of a directory, you use a new key. Uh, and it's set up in a way that if you have a newer uh, key for some, sort of some directory or file, then you won't be able to read past versions of that file, but you will be able to read future ones. Uh, so this whole kind of um, structuring of your file system and sharing just subparts of your file system with, um, let's say, an app uh, poses a problem. And that is, what if you want to update the root of your file system, but you can't actually read it or write to it, hence? Uh, and so what you do is you have some deterministic way of addressing new versions of every file and directory, uh, and you just write as far as you can and root your system as far as you can. And once someone else who has more uh, write access, essentially, to your file system comes along, um, they can then later 
uh, start incorporating the new version uh, of all of your files and directories in the root. Uh, so one other problem that we were addressing um, was that when you have this kind of across time ratcheting of um, the keys in a directory or file, uh, then you often end up with a situation where you were, went offline for a while, uh, some other kind of node, you, you worked on your laptop for a while and you open up your phone and you want to read the new version of your file system, uh, then you need to fast forward a bunch of times until you finally arrive at the new version of uh, your file system, which is not ideal. And so uh, Brooke uh, invented something uh, that we're calling a skip ratchet. Um, and it's essentially a way of deriving new keys in a, so that uh, getting to like the most recent version of your um, key is just a o, o log n operation instead of an O of n operation. Uh, if you know, want to know more about that, um, ask Brooke. Uh, we have a paper. Um, one more thing I've just uh, talked about, read access all the time now, but we also want to have write access, so we want to have this uh, use case of, let's say, an operator, let's say Fission, um, who's storing data on behalf of users, uh, but then users will come to this, uh, come to us, come to Fission, and say, here's a new version of a file system, but it's all encrypted, and Fission doesn't know who no is able to read what or to write to which files and directories, because we can't read the file system. So what we're doing is um, we have a naming scheme for every file and directory that is based on Bloom filters uh, that essentially, like a normal public file path, contains all of the segments of all of the ancestors of your file, um, but in a way that you can actually read it out directly um, and that obscures as much information as possible. And uh, yeah, that is based on Bloom filters. Um, we're adding some random garbage into it, which we call saturation of Bloom filters, so that uh, you can't actually um, distinguish lots of Bloom filters from uh, each other in the, uh, in the implementation, and that obscures more metadata. Um, Another thing we care about in terms of obscure metadata is we don't actually want to expose the DAG structure or the file system structure um, publicly. So when you look at a WinFS um, from like the public site and you browse it in a gateway or something, um, you shouldn't see how deep the file system hierarchy is in uh, someone's file system or how big the files are, they need to be split up, et cetera. And so what we do is all of these links that exist uh, between files in reality, uh, we blow them away, and instead we put all of the encrypted nodes into some roughly balanced uh, data structure that is, uh, for our intents and purposes, just say hammed. Um, and when someone actually goes into this hammed and starts decrypting nodes, they can re, uh, reconstruct all of the links in between files and directories. Um, the structure we're using is just a hand based on the Falcon uh, hand implementation. And with degree 16, we've, we found that that works fairly well and has a, nice, a couple of nice properties. Um, we can easily check append only things. We can have small diffs uh, for updates. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, that's it. Uh, there's a couple links on here. Um, we've been uh, doing the majority of the, the spec work in the development the last couple of years, but a few other teams have started to pick this up as well, so we've extracted it out into its own working group. That's uh, github.com slash webnita file system, which is a lot of characters, I realize. Um, and if you want just the spec, then slash spec. Um, and then for the people watching this in the future, um, a more in-depth uh, talk, um, I'll be giving a, a, a longer presentation about this at Strange Loop this year. So that hopefully in the future when you're watching this, uh, that will be up as well. Great, thanks. Thank you.